The next talk will be given by Dan Walsh um, from Red Hat about generating SecCom profiles for containers using Podman and eBPF. Enjoy. Oh. All right. Thank, thanks for having me. Um, I was here last year. I gave a talk on replacing uh, Docker with Podman, um, and this is you know, not that much about Podman, but um, Podman's the tool that we're we're using um, to do this. But I don't know if I did this last year, but I usually do this before since it drives me nuts. Everybody please stand up. <laughs> please read out loud all text that is in. Okay. As, uh, I, this is my Dan Quixote movement, and I'm just trying to get people to you know, expand behind, be, be, not have to prefix every word with D-O-C-K-E-R, um, unless you want to call all Linuxes Red Hat Linux, but you know. Um, so uh, so the, the goal of this, this talk, or with, with this tool that we're developing is, is to um, basically run a container with tighter Cisco, tighter, this is called filtering with seccomp. Does everybody know what seccomp is? So, all right, good. Most of you. So basically, I mean, what seccomp does is it allows us to shrink the attack surface on the kernel. So it's one of the. There's, there's, when I give talks on container security, I used to talk about, um, you know, you know, things like SE Linux and capabilities, and you get to seccomp, and seccomp is really cool in that we can basically take. Um, you know, you know, a Linux system, there's 600, uh, the x86-64 machine, there's about 650 syscalls. And if we can cut out you know, a whole bunch of those syscalls, then a vulnerability in any one of those syscalls that light leads to a kernel exploit, um, if you don't have that syscall, you can't get the kernel exploit, right? And so what we really want to do is cut down on um, syscalls. So, um, but when we're looking at this, um, so this really, uh, this is what Wikipedia defines as seccomp, um, but this really talking about the initial seccomp, um, which I cut down to, I think, four syscalls. I think it was read, write, execute, it's in there somewhere. But we're really talking about seccomp BPF, which is the thing that Google uh, further enhanced the original seccomp um, to basically allow you to have all syscalls and then you know, allow you to choose which ones you want to uh, control. Um, so the goal, again, is to run containers with tighter syscall filtering. Um, so the state of the art in containers was actually de developed by Jesse Frizzell. So Jesse Frizzell at the time was working for uh, Docker, and she wrote a really um, uh, a rant on use what she called a rant on usability, use usable security. Um, so what, really what we uh, needed to do is we wanted to take advantage of seccomp, but the type of jobs that run inside of containers are so varied. And she said they haven't written a default seccomp profile for Docker. I'm pretty familiar with how hard it is for people to use. And it requires a deep knowledge of application, being contained in syscalls. You know, what syscalls does a container require? And then she says down here, turning on something that will cause EPERM by default if we left it important, syscall is terrifying. So really what she's saying here is if we had a tight um, syscall filters running inside of all these containers, then um, you know, it would just cause people to turn off seccomp, right, to turn it off. So we had to have sort of a, uh, uh, a general, um, you know, fairly loose uh, capability for seccomps. Um, the idea is to build, you know, what, what she wanted was a build time generated and applied on the run seccomp filters. Uh, and then she basically says down here, if it causes any, uh, causes any problems, people will just turn off the security. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. And this happens all the time with, and of course, I see Linux, she mentions, you know, because I'm sure everybody in this room has a set in force there. I mean, set in force one, you know. But um, anyways, so, ooh, my picture didn't show up. Oh, that's too bad. Um, I always had the problem with the, the term one size fits all. So there's supposed to be a picture there with a, with a little tiny hat on his head. So imagine, I have a size eight head, 
head, right? So it's a very large head. And anytime I shop for a hat, it's always a hassle. And, and you pick up these hats that say one size fits all, and I put it on my head, and it looks like a little beanie on me. So security is the same thing, right? We have one size, with our container world, we have one size fits all for, for the, the security. And, and really, unless you're gonna go deep into uh, analyzing how containers run, how do you figure out what syscalls your uh, application is gonna do? So what we decided to do this summer is, uh, oh, so I'll talk a little quickly about what SC Linux did. SC Linux really had the same problem, right? Um, SC Linux policy is basically picking out a certain application, say Apache application, or, um, you know, a database, and what, what SC Linux did is we would have sort of general rules. We'd have a general idea of how an application would run, and we'd write a generalized framework for what the application did. Then we would basically put that policy in place and run it in what we call permissive mode and, and just basically run it through an entire test suite. And then we'd go to auditing system. Um, we'd go to the audit logs and basically continuously pull out the rules as they came along. And there was a tool called audit to allow that translated um, the ABC rules that were showing up in audit logs into allow rules. Um, and then we go back to step two and just keep on it. And I don't know if people, my first computer course I ever took was uh, explaining how you would write a program for taking a shower in the morning with shampoo. And it used to say lather, rinse, repeat. And of course, you'd, you'd be in the shower until the, the thing um, ran out of shampoo and while well, the kernel crashed, right? Um, so basically, you'd, you'd keep on doing this. Then we would take that policy, we would actually put it out into Fedora, into Rawhide, and we'd get bug reports, and continuously get bug reports. And over time, we figured out what the application did. So it's, it's not easy to figure out uh, applications, how they work. So this summer, we decided to do a Google, try to, try to build tools that we could at least do what we did with SE Linux um, to figure out seccomp rules. Um, so the, this guy here, Divyash, uh did most of the work on this, and Valentin Rothberg is on my team, and he uh, really sort of mentored, mentored him, and I was involved in the process as well. Um, I wanted to have the, one of those two guys give this talk, but uh, neither one of them could make it here, so that's why you get me. So the first step we wanted to do is we wanted to investigate how we would figure out what syscalls were happening inside of a container. Um, and the first idea everybody has is, oh, just use this, you know, S trace or you know, a P trace. And uh, you know, as if you saw Inspector Gadget yesterday, you'd realize that that's uh, slow and very difficult to filter. Um, it's also hard to figure out what the processes inside of the container are and and how to follow along with that. Um, so the next next step is is we could do what SE Linux did, which is basically, you know turn on set comp filtering auditing and then just keep on going to the audit logs and, and get the information out of the audit log um, you know about which this calls are being called so the kernel report can report those to the thing but the, the problem is the kernel is just going to start spewing all audit logs all sys calls to it um, or you could get it down to a process but there's no idea in the audit log what a container is right the linux kernel has no idea what a container is and there's been a pull request in the kernel for five, six, seven years now to add what's called a container ID to the, uh, to the audit log. So you could actually go into an audit log and figure out at least that all these processes are coming from the same container and maybe eventually trace a bunch of processes back to an individual container. So because of that, it became very quickly um, uh, difficult to figure out with the audit log, um, you know, which container generated them. Um, so we basically went and looked at eBPF at this point, um, and, and eBPF was, just, you know, to me, is a really cool thing. And, and as I said, I'm giving a lot of credit to Inspector Gadget. That was that was really an awesome presentation uh, to show all the different things you can start to do with eBPF, basically revealing information out of the kernel. Um, so what we're doing is very similar. Um, basically, we're watching for sysenter uh, of um, the process, but basically the process. Uh, Every time you, know, you go into sysenter in that on a PID ID, and you're able to watch um, all the syscalls that basically that process uh, generates, um, and we can generate watch all of its children and grandchildren. The the other thing that we did, so the talk on Inspector Gadget yesterday talked about they were taking advantage of C groups V2 to basically figure out which processes are inside of the container. Um, 
The problem is we don't have C group V2 everywhere, so we relied on, we're, we're basically looking at the syscalls as they come in and looking at the PID namespace and basically deciding whether or not the process is inside the container based on the PID namespace. Um, so it's a little bit different, but eventually once C groups V2 uh, becomes prevalent, I think we'd probably want to take advantage of that um, filtering. Um, but basically, so this is basically what's going on inside of this thing. So one of the things we needed to do um, is figure out an interesting problem in this is run C creates the process, the PID1 of the container early in the, early in the process, but then it continues to do stuff in that process of state. And those things that it's doing, we don't want to record as being part of the seccomp filter. So what we really needed to do is figure out like there's, there's three or four syscalls that come in in the beginning that we basically need to dump out because we don't want those being allowed because they're very, very privileged. Because you imagine run C is setting up user namespaces and names, all that type of stuff. We didn't want it being allowed to the container process. Um, so uh, so we, he's opened up a pull request. And originally, this talk even says that this is, is associated with uh, um, Podman. It's being done underneath Podman, but he's, he's basically creating an OCI runtime. So an, uh, an OCI runtime. Um, that can be run inside of any container engine. So you could run it inside your Kubernetes underneath Cryo, Container D. Um, theoretically, you can run it with Docker, um, Podman, anything can do it because it's really separate from the tool, but we'll be using Podman to uh, generate it. Uh, right now, it's a pull request on Podman, but I think we're going to put it in as a separate, uh, separate package so that people can just download and play with. So how to start tracing? Well, we need to know how to, when the container starts. Okay, so you run Podman, the container doesn't start when Podman, Podman's going to go out and create an OCI runtime. OCI runtime's going to be run, read by run C. Run C eventually is going to do the fork and exec to create the PID1 in the container, and then it's going to launch, actually exec the container. So the container doesn't start till that last point. Um, so the best way to do that is with OCI hooks, because what an OCI hook is in the OCI spec, the OCI runtime will call out to individual hooks at certain parts of the development phase. So basically, after it creates the PID, PID1 of the container, it actually stops and calls out to the OCI hook and basically hands us, at that point, the actual PID that's going to be the, the PID of the container. But the container's not doing anything yet. Um, so history of OCI hooks, they've been around for a little while. Um, they allow you to do things like uh, pre-start and post-stop. So OCI, the, the OCI tools will call in as the container starts and as the container stops, um, different phases of it. Uh, so what we have is we run the trace of when the uh, OCI on the pre-start attaches the eBPF program to it, uh, watch for the enter trace, and then start mapping. And then when we're done, we basically send, right now he sends a signal to the process to say the container is done, so save out to your file. So we use Podman for testing, and one of the cool things we did with OCI hooks, and I'm going to show you what an OCI hooks looks like in a second, is you can actually set up OCI hooks so that they only run on certain conditions. So there's like an OCI, the, the, the first one we built was OCI system D hook, so we could set up system D environment before it runs a container. Um, but you'd want to know if the container is going to be running PID1 of system D. So another thing you can do is you can do this annotations. So this is the way you trigger a container to basically start uh, doing the seccomp filtering. And it basically says using IO container sys syscall, and then we're outputting to a certain file. And that's the file we're going to look at um, generating the syscall uh, filters. OK, so let's actually do a demo. Okay, um, so when I talked about one size fits all, just before I sat to down to do this, uh, start talking to you guys, I went and grabbed, I remember I said there's 650 syscalls in, in, uh, in x86-64. Uh, well, just turning on seccomp, you eliminate half of them because you, you don't tend to run 32-bit code inside of a container, so we can turn off all the 32-bit syscalls. So that drops us down to around 325 syscalls. If you go through Jesse Frizzell's syscall thing, it drops it down to about 313 syscalls. So as much as seccomp seems like it's going to be powerful, this, the, we need, require all these hundreds of syscalls um, just to have general purpose and not everybody turning it off. So it, it, it's good. You know, we went from 650 down to 313, but it could be better. 
Okay. So this is what, a, uh, when you're running uh, hooks inside of a, um, OCI hooks, this is sort of what they look like. You have a, the definition of the hook, the executable, and then you can basically tell, tell the uh, specification that I only want to run it if I have an annotation that looks like that. Otherwise, this won't, just the executable won't start, so you don't have overhead if you're not filtering. Um, so that's basically what a, a specification looks like. So right now I'm running, so up here you see I'm running a, the container, um, running Podman, annotation of that, writing out the syscall, and I just did an ls of, of slash to generate, poly, uh, to generate the syscall, and that generated something that looked like this. So basically it says I'm generating, uh, it's a JSON file that uh, the container the OCI understands, and it basically says default action is to return an error, um, but if I allow it, then just allow it, and these are the rules, the syscalls that it actually found when it was running. So now I'm going to run the container. So this time I changed the option on Podman to actually use my newly generated setcom filter. So this time, the original one, I used the default, which is the one Jesse Frizzell wrote. Now I'm running the same exact command, and sure enough, it fully allows it. So I decide to change around down here. I'm about to run, and I'm going to run it with an ls-l. Okay, so just slightly more, but I'm still running with that nice tight policy. And guess what? I get permission denied. So because I'm running setcom filters on it, now just adding the dash l uh, causes a problem. If I go into the audit logs, you'll see all the audit logs generating all the, uh, the syscalls that happen. So basically, if you look at this, the first one didn't do it. This one's looking for XAD. It's basically trying to read the attributes of the individual files inside of it. Um, down here is actually the ones that were uh, missing. So there's actually a connect, a few, few texts, get PIDs, get TIDs. Uh, so basically what's happening here um, is th this is actually going out and creating a socket. So if just doing an ls-l of a file actually goes out when it's doing the get PID PW users, basically looking at the user ID, that's actually going to talk to SSSD on the system and actually get connect a socket, a Unix domain socket to that. Um, so you can imagine that this just suddenly there's an expansion of, of the amount of syscalls just by adding that. So now I'm going to take these syscalls that got, basically I have bash groups that, that grow, grabbed them. This is when you do the unthinkable and actually run a BI on a JSON in front of 50 people and hope that you don't screw up. So I just added those rules to my seccom filter, to the temp seccom filter, and voila. So it just took those rules, added them in um, to the system, and basically allowed me to run, and now I'm just going to give you, so here's the, the original rules versus the new rules added to it. And that's it. So basically the idea here is that we could take um, this tool and start to run, say in your CI CD system, you might want to run all of your tests, the full test suite on top of an uh, individual container and then generate your set comp. Uh, rules based on that, and then when you're shipping, uh, you know, shipping it, you would ship that second filter, and you can use with any container runtime. You can specify. I have one minute left. Holy smokes! Okay. Um, so, anyways, you could ship that second filter. Obviously, there's going to be problems, and that's why we turn on the audit. So, any of the any syscalls, you can start to monitor those audits to see if you're getting any uh, denials. But this gives you the opportunity, potential opportunity, to generate syscall filters at a very small phase. A couple of problems with seccomp. Um, this one, uh, a lot of people aren't using seccomp right now because they think it uh, is slow. But we actually found that for some reason, live seccomp by default turns on 
the Spectre Meltdown protections, which is a huge performance hit, like a 25% performance hit. So a lot of people are saying that SecComp is, is slow because this is a side effect. So the latest code, we just got it into the OCI Extreme, allows us to specify way, whether we want the Spectre Meltdown to go on and allows us to turn on that, um, the auditing system to um, be able to do it. So in this quick sec section, I'm going to ask for questions. And anybody who wants to talk about friendly EPARM, I'd love to talk about that, but I'm out of time. Any questions? Yes. Um, I guess when you run an application, it's, you are not going to take all the possible code paths. So there are, there Correct. is always going to be possibly uh, this code that you miss. Correct. So, I mean, the, so the, the question is you know, basically there's always going to be additional syscalls. And, and, and the funny thing is I can actually, I mean, with containers it's less likely, but like traditionally in SE Linux it was more about people modifying, say, NS switch files and so, you know, so all of a sudden they add, you know, this full LDAP stack that's happening because I did an LS-L. So I'm calling out to, you know, the, the DNS resolvers and all this stuff. So there's all these side effects potentially. Um, yeah, but it's a fundamental problem as we try to tighten the security on things that, that depending on the different code paths, there, there's going to be issues, there's potential issues. But for pe this, is, this, one of the things we did with SE Linux is we actually, and, and maybe we'll do this with this eventually, is there's certain actions that we know, you know, we'll see one syscall like LS, uh, gets that, and all of a sudden we know that, you know, our read, read involves like five syscalls. It's like lock, get at her, read. So as soon as you see a read, we should just instantaneously give all five of those syscalls to it. So we could start to build up sort of uh, understanding of the system to add a whole groups of syscalls. But my goal is to get, if I can get from 333 down to 200, that would be a huge improvement. But I do take the risk of suddenly a change in configuration is going to cause get at her. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about friendly EPRM is exactly that. So. I'll just quickly go into friendly EPRM before he throws me out of here. Um, so friendly EPRM was, was, this was actually uh, a proposal we had back in 2010. We saw this coming. Right now, when you run a process on a Linux system, there's about 10 different ways you can get permission denied. Right? So you can get permission denied by SecCop. You can get it from user namespace. You can get it from regular Unix ownership permissions, that's called discretionary access control. You can get it from SC Linux, you can get it from AppOn, you can get it from like five other LSMs, you can get it from user namespace. The tools basically get permission denied. You as a user, what do you do when your application gets permission denied? Right. Okay, sudo. Okay, that's one thing you do. What's the other thing if you do and you're running containers with Podman, what are you going to do? Dash dash permissive, right? Right? So that's instantaneously, we turn off all of the protections. And the reason for that is because you can't figure out, even if you contact me, and I pretty much know why you're going to get permission denied, I can't figure it out without making you go and do like 10 different rock fetches. Okay, turn off SC Linux. Okay, nope, that didn't do it. Turn SC Linux back on, turn off SecComp. Nope, that didn't do it. Turn off capabilities. Start adding these certain capabilities. Who knows why you got permission denied? The friggin' kernel knows. Okay, and the kernel ain't telling you. Or if it's telling you, it's putting it in some random place in the operating system that you don't know. Right? SC Linux issues and now SecOp issues go to the audit log. So Apache gets an error, permission denied. It can't write into the, its log file saying, I'm not allowed to do this because SC Linux blocked me. Or I'm not allowed to do this because I don't have the capabilities. Right? And so we have this fundamental problem with security, and the only option people have is to turn it off. So we opened up Friendly EPERM years ago because we wanted the frigging kernel to tell us why you're giving us permission tonight. We wanted to allow Apache to go to the kernel and say, why did you just deny me that? Right? And it's inherently racy. Right? The whole syscall, the only thing the syscall can return you is EPERM. So originally we were saying, well, maybe we could return like a secondary thing that said, you know, Here's a little tag that says why. Or after the secondary phase, we wanted to go to look into the system and say, say the proc system and say, give me a proc status. Why'd you give me a friggin' e EPRM? And I come up with an SE Linux line that's saying SE Linux blocked it, and now you could write it to your log file. And that's racy because me asking the <laughs> proc, I could get permission tonight. So basically, le le Linus. We went back and forth on this for a while, and Linus finally told us, you know, get lost. 
And now we come eight years later, nine years later, and it's 10 times worse. Now everybody that's running containers is facing this problem. So with the stuff that he showed in Spectre Gadget yesterday, or with this fe feature, my goal now is to get to the point where we potentially could use eBPF to go to the kernel and say, you know, so you could basically run a container, get permission denied, and say, okay, let me set an annotation, run the container again, and have the kernel tell me why I'm getting permission denied. And you could actually figure out what's going on, figure out, you know, right now, as I said, you know, that. So, anyways, yes. When's the next talk? At, as a developer on some of these things. Can I get a friendly Ian e Val as well? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the go, e, e and Val and EPERM are two ways of saying the same thing. But yeah, the, the goal would be to basically, when we have this, this, I don't know if it goes through Inspector Gadget, but basically this tool, and again, this is in my brain, not in any, anything in reality, if it could figure out, um, yeah, allow you to specify which, which error node from a syscall you would want to basically ask the kernel, why did you give me that, you know, that error node and, and have the kernel reveal some information. Last question. Yeah. Would it make sense to rely on static code analysis uh, to figure out which second profile you need, uh, kind of as an answer yeah, to not triggering it, all the code paths? I mean, uh, we haven't talked about that from a syscall point of view, but that used to be all, asked all the time with SC Linux. The problem is that it's not, you, you can look at your code to your blue in the face, but you have to basically go and analyze all of glibc. Uh, right? I mean, maybe, maybe if you have a static program, it, that, that might be possible, but the, the issues with SC Linux, we kind of knew what the application was doing. It was when people would change the un underlying tooling on the system that you would end up with problems just by, you know, as I said, setting up, set up NFS, put an NFS home directory on there, and all of a sudden, you know, the whole world changes, or, you know. And that's, you don't have yellow pages anymore, but yellow pages used to be like, everything's open. <laughs> yeah. All ports, all things, so it's tough. Okay, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you a lot.